Hey, I'm Veronica from Uexpressure. Let me briefly introduce you to what we at Uexpressure do. Uexpressure is an online platform where you can build customer journey maps, impact maps and personas for your organization. With more than 100 ready-to-use templates, you can speed up your persona creation and mapping processes. To help you build confidence on your journey and learn from other practitioners, we host community events on user, customer, employee experience and all things journey mapping. Our speakers are industry experts that are willing to share their knowledge to help you design and build better products and services. We also speak at the events ourselves and share tips and tricks we learned through years of practice and numerous interviews with other mappers. On top of that, we have your Expression Academy where you can dive into learning how to build journey maps, personas and conduct interviews. And do that all at your own pace. Don't forget to check it out and enjoy the event. Let's talk some uh, some more about UX research and then in particular in a challenging business environment. Uh, now you've told me that a lot of people have signed up. So that's for me confirmation that a lot of people are struggling with um, being allowed to do UX research or maybe UX design the way it's intended uh, at their current jobs, which is um, which is sad because we, we want to do our job without uh, stakeholders saying, well, let's not do it and stuff like that. Um, I've been working on this for a long time. So I think I've, I've seen a, quite a few things that, that work and also a few things that, doesn't, that don't work. And now I have a strategy and that's the main thing that I want to share with you today. But before uh, I do, I think most of my introduction has already been told, <laughs> but just to uh, to summarize, I've been in UX for eight years now, since 2015, and I've worked almost in every type of, of company, uh, you know, from a, a small startup to a creative agency and uh, government agencies, uh, large corporations, multinational banks, and it's a recurring topic, being allowed to do your UX research. And in most cases, that's a big struggle. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, like you already said, I have my day job. So I'm a senior designer, but depending on the project, it can also be a researcher, um, a UI UX designer, or even service design. It just depends on, on the project and I'm comfortable doing uh, well, different roles depending on the, on the project. Uh, designer's toolbox is something that I do in the weekends and in the evenings. It's about helping other people, other designers either get into design or just build a career in design. So that's mentorships, uh, events like this, you know, just helping people, trying to give back um, to the community. and. A new one is UX dictionary. And well, that's not much to say about, except for that it's literally a dictionary for UX designers or people who are working with UX designers. You know, we have quite a few keywords that not everyone understands. So um, I tried to create a dictionary for that to make it easier for everyone to understand UX and to, to work with us. So um, that's the introduction. Let's go to the actual problem at hand. So I hope this is familiar for you. I'm going to, to tell you a, a, well, a story that's uh, been happening to me quite often, sadly. And that's when you're halfway through your design project, when you've done a lot of, um, well, initial research, you know, talking to stakeholders, you know, understanding the project, you have your first few sketches Actually, you're ready to go now, and now you want to validate your ideas. Just see, well, are we on the right track, or do we have to change something? So I want to go for user testing. I mean, that makes sense. That's what we've been taught in school and in boot camps. Now we have to test, and this is the moment to test. And then you go to your stakeholder. You say, well, we want to test now. You know, who can we test it with? Do you know some users? How can we? recruit some users, some participants, and then the stakeholder tells you, well, there's no need. We'll test for problems when we're live. 
And um, this is not a made up quote. This is something that actually happened to me in the summer of last year. Uh, my main stakeholder, you know, the one that was responsible for paying our project, he was super convinced that uh, we didn't need to test. That's something to do when we're live. Uh, arguments didn't help, you know, explaining all the reasons for testing didn't help. Um, another thing he said was, well, you're a designer, you know how to design right. Why do you want to test? Don't you understand how design works? Stuff like that. Um, needless to say, very annoying when that happens. Um, and I can go on and on about uh, examples and, and different situations, but let's not do that. Um, I have a question for you. I, we have a poll and um, you know that story that I just told, that stakeholder who doesn't allow you to do your research, to test your design. Is that something you've encountered before? And a poll should appear for you now. So have you encountered this before? Yes or no? So one thing that I noticed, you know, doing multiple projects in different industries, different types of companies, is that sadly this, well, this happens everywhere. It's not that it's only happening at, you know, at big, large corporations. Um, you know, small companies with one or two people, they can cause the same problem. Um, it's a myth that people have been telling me, you know, it's only in large corporations. Uh, in my experience, that's not the case. It happens everywhere. So let's look at the situation. I think that's that's very important. Um, I have a strategy later, so a step-by-step -step plan and what I would do in this situation. Um, but first, we need to understand the situation. And um, you know, years ago, I've always been about well, you know, it's all about the company. The company is stupid; they don't understand me. They should understand me. But um, recently, I've started to understand that it's it's just um, as much about you and me, you know, we as designers, as it is about the company. And um, you know, if you want to change uh, something, I always like to start with myself. Before I start pointing out, like, you should change, I don't think that's a very friendly way of doing things. So the first few things that I want to mention, the first factors that are at play here is about you well, and me, of course, uh, about the designer uh, that's uh, in the project. So I have another question for you. And um, the question is, why are you hired? And you have three options. Um, in case you don't have a job at the moment or you're looking for your first job, then you can answer this while you know, thinking, why would I be hired? If I were hired, what would be uh, the reason? What I think why you're hired is well, you're hired by a company and to help that company. And I think that's a very important mindset to have. That you know, in school, um, in boot camps, and I've been taught this way as well, that you are all about you know, helping the user and designing you know, a user experience that's delightful, easy to use and stuff like that. But you know, the person who's paying you to do design work is, uh, in most cases, a business. And that person is hiring you to help them make even more money and if you weren't there, you know, that person would probably implement some dark patterns and be very terrible for the user. Um, and that's why you are there. You are there to protect the user, but also to help that company um, not go broke and <laughs> to make them more money. Um, so you are the safeguard for the user, but first and foremost, you are hired by a company. You're right in the middle. So if you would look at a um, you know at the the steps in a row, you know, good design for users, and that makes money. You know, if you enjoy your product, you're more likely to return to your to that product you know, as if you're a user, and you're more more likely to pay for that project uh, for that product and to keep paying for that product. 
furthermore, you're also more likely to recommend it to your friends and family. You know, you're, you're going to be like, well, have you seen this app? It's great. It works flawlessly. It makes my day better. You should check it out. I mean, that's how it works. And most people, most designers, they, they focus on good design. But instead, try and focus on the money first. So if you're talking to your stakeholders and you say, well, we want to, to have an evenly distributed grid because it looks better. Well, your stakeholder might think, well, you know, how does that make me money? So if you turn it around and first, firstly focus on, you know, if we create a design that's evenly distributed uh, amongst the screen, it's easier to use and less people will, will leave your app because there's less friction, there's less cognitive load, then we can make more, more money. You know, that, if that stakeholder hears more money, then you got his attention. And then we make more money by using a good design. You know, if we turn it around that way, that's uh, the way to grab attention. So that mind shift, that's necessary. It's, it's very important to understand why you are hired and who has hired you. So focus on helping that person first and on the user after that. You know, it's important not to forget the user, but it's not only about the user. I think that's the best way to put it. So the next thing is another example that has happened to me in real life. And that's um, an onboarding flow that I was designing. You know, a login, a register, forgot password, um, you know, all that kind of stuff that you see in your onboarding flow. Um, somewhere in that flow, some designers and I, we got into a discussion. A stakeholder was also involved. You know, here at step, step something, let's say step three, um, the discussion started about, well, where should we put the buttons? You know, the next button, the save button, the return button, all these kinds of buttons, you know, should we put it to the left? Should we put it to the right? Maybe the top corner or the bottom corner? Lots of questions. Um, I, as a designer, I want to test this. And um, my colleague designers also wanted to test this. So imagine this, you are in your onboarding flow, you're a designer in the midst of your project and a discussion like this, happens or should we put it to the left or to the right should we test this that's not a question for you should we test this yes or no what i think at this moment is that we should not test it at this moment and um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't test it at all um, but um, stakeholders who are very um, distrustful about testing and they don't really want you to test uh, anything because it takes time, it takes effort and money. Um, let's say you have one shot, you know, you have one try. Um, I wouldn't waste it on just should we put the button to the left or to the right. And if I can, can convince my stakeholder of allowing me one test, I would ask this person to test the entire on onboarding flow. Again, with the arguments, like I mentioned before, like if we make this as easy as possible, you can get more users and more users means more revenue. And then this person is more likely to accept it. And then I can take the entire onboarding flow that includes the button. Uh, furthermore, it's also that, you know, one position of a button inside of the entire flow, you know, it, it needs more context. So I, I would save this, um, this question for later. I wouldn't test it right now. And the main thing behind that, if we take one step back, is that um, you have to be very, you have, need to have a, a radar. You know, you have to be very aware of, you know, when should I go for a test? When should I spend my uh you know play my cards you know when should i go for the test and i think you should go for the big ones and not for every little thing 
just to um, save save for that one moment where you can convince your stakeholders. Let's go back to that stakeholder that I mentioned before. You know, the one that said no need to test. Um, we'll do it when it's live. You're a designer, so you should know these things. You know, that very annoying uh, remark from that person. Um, the problem was that this person was the head of my division. So, you know, I was just a, a mid-level designer at that moment. And um, you know, I could bring all the reasons and, and um, theory and research to the discussion. But he, he was like, well, no, I'm the head of your division. I pay for this project. So we're doing it my way. And that's a problem. Um, it's like, you know, my rank wasn't high enough in his eyes. And that's a very silly thing to to believe in, I would say, because, you know, even a, an entry level designer can bring new insights to the table and a head of design or, you know, the CEO of your company, it doesn't matter what your level is, right? You, you should be open to someone else's points. Um, and that's the case in theory. Sadly, in practice, that's not the case as I've experienced. So what you should try to do um, is to level the playing field. You know, it's it's not fair to you know, play one designer versus the head of your division. Um, and how to solve that, that brings us to the second half of the equation. You know, remember a few minutes ago, we had you and the company. We still have to look at the company. And um, I have a question for you again. So if looking at your company, or maybe a company that you worked for before, you know, in case you don't have a project or a job at this moment, does your company have a designer or someone with a design background on the board? And when I say board, I mean like you know the, the management team or the board of directors, depending on the size of your company. Question again is yes or no. And um, curious to see the results of this one, because this is a very tricky one. In my experience, you know, I would have voted no in, in this case. Um, what I've seen in most cases is if you start at the top and, and move down you know, in the board of directors, there's rarely a designer uh, in management teams. So that's like mid-level management. There's sometimes a designer, um, but in almost any case, I've seen that there is a lead designer and of course the team has a designer. And the problem here is that um, you know, if you are in a team, you know, it's hard to reach the board of directors just as an individual. These people are very busy and they only listen to you know, management teams. But if there's no designer there, it's a, a big challenge to um, well, to, to get someone to allow you to, um, well, to do your research. That's, I think that's the main problem. So what I would do in that previous situation, you know, where I was a mid-level designer and um, I was talking against the head, of the head of the division, I would see if I could find someone on his level who was either a designer or a design advocate. You, know, you don't have to have a background in design, but if you believe in, in design and, and the power uh, it has and the things it can do, you know, if you involve that person in your discussion, you know, that, that stubborn stakeholder, the head of your division, is more likely to listen to his peers than, than he is to uh, some random mid-level designer. And I've been able to do that once at a project, and um, it was a real lifesaver. So that's something that's very important here. And it brings us to our strategy. Now, I gave something away already, you know, about leveling the playing field, but we will look some more at the strategy. And I must warn you here, not everybody's going to like this. And when I mean not everyone, not everybody, I don't mean the people in this room in this virtual room, but not everyone at your job is going to like this um, because you're about to go against the stream. 
you're not going to well if, if your head of design says we don't do this and you're going to convince people to do it anyway you know people might get angry at you um that has happened before to me <laughs> but that's a whole different story so not everybody's going to like this so continue with caution oh, and it's also a lot of work it's a lot of work with ups and downs that's going to cause you um well it, it, let's keep it at that it's a lot of work it's a long-term play it's not that i'm going to be able to give you some tips and tricks and that it's going to be better tomorrow but maybe you know in the second half of your project or later this year i think that's an important disclaimer to to make so the first thing to do is to figure out your battlefield it sounds a bit scary battlefield but i mean your office environment or your project you know the people who are working with you and why you're not allowed to do your research so think about that that you versus the company you know why um, why are you not allowed to do your research is it because of you maybe your mindset like i'm all about the user but i should be more about the business or do i have a stubborn uh stakeholder who doesn't really listen to in this in the stakeholder view you know low level employees you know those stakeholders exist sadly you, know, you have to figure out why why the your problems are going on and then you, know, you can't fix something without knowing where the problem lies so that's very important and you can do that first of all by keeping a notepad well, i always have my book here and uh, a pencil as well i write a lot during meetings um, you know just to to give me some clarity and um, because i'm likely to forget stuff that's happening also see if you can meet as many people in one-on-one -on -one meeting as you can now, this is especially helpful if you're just starting a project or if you're new at the company what i always try to do is ask well who should i meet there's always someone who's helping me onboard in a project so see if you can get a list of people this could be a product owner you know a manager um, someone from the management team it really depends on the size of the company and the different roles but see if you can meet as many people as you can and when you meet them you know introduce yourself but also listen to that that person and show some interest you know figure out what is important for that person and i think that's really key if you understand what's important for a stakeholder you can phrase your you know, your design pitch in a way that speaks to that person um i have one quick example before we continue to the next slide and that's you know one of my stakeholders he was very afraid that uh, doing research would slow down the project and it, it would maybe cause a delay in in releasing a product so you know instead of just shouting at him that i wanted to do my research i first phrased it in a way that I could do my research while the development team was continuing the development work. And that, you know, the, the, the quick wins that I discovered could be done in the same sprint without any delays. And um, well, that caused a shift in his belief and, and he allowed us to do one or two quick research sessions. You know, it's still not perfect, but at least it's something. And that's all by you know, changing that mindset from user first to how can I convince this stakeholder? And while doing so, I could still do user first work. You know, all I need was uh, a yes, a green sign from the stakeholder. So it might look like I don't care about the user, but actually I do. I'm just not telling the stakeholder about it because he doesn't really understand what I mean. You know, so that's the, the mask that I'm wearing when I'm talking to this person. Um, so doing that research, that brings me to step two. And that's work out a small win. You know, if, um, you know, continue, continuing with that same example, um, I was allowed to do some research. 
and that research resulted in some insights and a way for me to improve the product and um, a bonus tip that I'm thinking of just on the spot right now is to make sure that it's measurable uh, you can just say that something is better but if you can show it with data for example conversion rate or time on page or something like that then you can convince your stakeholders that it's actually helpful what you've been doing you know before my design we had a conversion rate of eight percent now we have eight and a half percent you know that's a half percent more and that means more revenue you know etc cetera, etc cetera. um and then your stakeholder will look at your research in a different light you know well that research is actually helpful he might say and if you do this enough something magical will happen and that's that's this i heard you helped rick increase his seed his click-through rate can you do the same for me you know different stakeholder um this has happened uh, a few times uh, luckily if you help someone you know, your, your stakeholders they have meetings as well you know the the product owner from one team talks to all the product owners from his division and um he will tell you about he will tell his stakeholders about his his success because he claims it as his own you know well my app has an improved ctr now because of nick's research well and then they're like wow well that's impressive and then people will start emailing you like hey can you do the same for me and then before you know it your name as a good designer who's able to help achieve business goals by doing well by the users is going to spread across the company and that's very important that's that's your way in and um, something that's been very helpful for me and then step three it's a bit of a a bit of a joke but also true <laughs> is step three is get very busy because that's what will happen you know it's something that takes a long time to get started but once you have that first win under your belt you know uh, the story will spread and people will get to you and you know if one person talks about you you know another one will join but if two people talk about you two new people will join it will grow exponentially so you will get very busy in the long run but luckily it's by doing good and fun work as a ux designer so um expect that to happen um just a quick summary you know if you look at you as a person uh, or you as a designer you know, this is as an intro for the next poll um you have your mindset about you know am i user first or am i hired by a company that's important also, the way you test things, should you test everything, or only the big things, just to ease a stakeholder into allowing you, you to test. And finally, you know, leveling the playing field, you know, involving more higher ups in your battles with your stakeholders, or on the other side, the company. You know, should the company change? So that's my question to you. If you look at your current job or at your project that you're working on, where can you find uh, some of the improvements that we talked about? Is it on your side as a designer? You know, should I change? Or should the company change? Or maybe both or neither? Um, I think you know, in, a, in a few moments, you know, maybe a minute or two or three, I think we can go to the Q&A. You know, I have a few slides left. Um, and then uh, I'm sure we will uh, find out what both means for you as um, you know, as a designer, I'm sure there will be some questions about it. Um, if you need help at some point, you, know, you can always send me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help you. You know, um, from the designer's toolbox, we have mentorships, consulting, anything, or just a quick question. You can always email me. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's my um, my talk up until this point. I think we then have a nice 20 minutes or so for a QA. and a I hope that, that there are a lot of questions and that this was uh, somewhat helpful for you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. as you said, uh, it's time for Q&A. Mm -hmm. And while people are typing in the questions in the chat, 
I will, I would like to remind that, uh, well, actually you can turn all your research findings into a journey map or an actionable journey map and do that all with your teammates in your expression platform. So feel free to register and start exploring the features on your own, or you can sign up for a personal demo and our team will be happy to highlight the functionality you might be interested in. So uh, now let's move to the questions that we have. And we have one question that was sent prior to the event. And actually, I think it's quite relevant because I see people typing in the chat that they're um, newbies, some sort of newbies in uh, UX design or research. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Akib Ahmed. Uh, who is an aspiring UX designer, uh, and he would love to know about the day-to-day -day activities performed by a UX researcher. Okay. Um, well, then I have to think about my previous project as a UX researcher. Um, it was a, a very difficult environment so the things that i talked about during the presentation was very relevant here so it's a lot of uh, meeting with stakeholders um, making sure we're allowed to do the work that we want to do and to visit the workplace to do user research um, but if you leave you know the, the politics aside you know the actual ux research was um you know, visiting users in their workplace. You know, I like to do a work visit to really understand what they're going through, what they're doing. Um, preparing for those visits. You know, what do I want to ask? Uh, who do I want to speak with? And also afterwards, you know, what did I actually see? You know, what's the the pattern here? What's the user pain point here? What kind of what can we do? Um, workshops is something that I do a lot as a UX researcher. You know, um, you, I start with you know, talking to people and then you, you get some in, insights and then I want to involve those users again to um, you know, participate in a workshop to, um, or to work together on a solution for their problems. Um, and finally, presenting your insights. You know, you, people hire you to figure out why something doesn't work the way they want, uh, want it to. When at some point I have a, quite a, a good clue of why that is. And then they're curious to hear about it as well. You know, well, what's the result? So that's a bit of presenting. Um, I like the work visits and the workshops best. I mean, that's always good energy. The users are very, help, very happy uh, to see to see you appear because you're you're helping them thank you nick uh well, hopefully that was helpful I hope and, so we, well. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a question from maureen and well that's a huge question so listen mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. uh the yeah. question is uh my my stakeholder wants us to get user input uh, but is uninterested in taking our recommendations for how to answer his question through research. He insists on a particular methodology and wants to tell us how to format these, the questions, even mm -hmm. though it's not a real user research method, uh, like asking people to predict their wants, needs for a future. How do I encourage his desire for user research without bowing down to conducting research his way? I've already presented the reasons why his request is risky and provided recommendations on how to proceed instead. Yeah, I think this one's uh, you know closely related to you know the the roles within the company. You know, if if he is the the person who is paying you, then you have to see if you can find someone on his level, you know, who is more open minded and involve that person in the. Uh, in the in the discussion, uh, but that of course depends on the size of your company. You know, if it's one owner and then you are the designer, and then that's it. You know, then that's very hard, uh, of course. Um, but see if you can do that. Uh, second tip is to well listen to what he's saying, um, and I don't mean you know just accept and move on, but listen. Like, can you discover what he finds important? You know, if 
he has his reasons for pushing his way of doing things, you know, and um, if you can discover why, then you can turn around the way you present your reasons and maybe he might be more open to, uh, to listening to you. Marine, let me know if that was the answer mm -hmm. to your question. Thank you. Yes, that was the answer. So the next question is, what, uh, what are your thoughts about quick and dirty research in the first place? Do you think they are reliable? Um, well, that, that depends on what you mean with, with quick and dirty. I mean, is that... Uh... Well, maybe that's the question back to the, the question asker. Once again, uh, which is, do you have user research methods that are quick and dirty when you don't have a lot of budget and time to actually conduct it? Hmm. And uh, by the way, Joy, we still have that question is what you mean by quick and dirty, right? Yeah, well, now, now, now it makes, I, I think I know what what, um, what is meant by quick and dirty, you know, instead of doing a, you know, usability lab, very expensive, big research. You know, what else can you do if you have to do something quickly? Um, well, I, I remember a project where I wasn't allowed to, uh, oh, it was for a bank and the bank has the, the big offices, but also the local branches. And, um, you know, the stakeholder told me, well, it's very difficult to find uh, stakeholders sorry to find participants so let's not try at all and then I, I just went to my local branch of that that bank anyway because I didn't really believe that it was so difficult and uh, as a result these people were very happy to talk to me and they all knew some other people from other branches and before I knew it I had a few 30 minute phone calls scheduled to uh, talk to actual users so um yeah, that stakeholder wasn't right in saying that it was very difficult and that, would, that it would take a lot of time. You know, I could speak to 10 people in one day. Um, so that's what I think, what, what what you mean with quick and dirty. So sometimes you have to go, uh, you have to break a few rules for the bigger good. And here is the second part of the question. And if you might struggle to get an actual users or clients to talk to, are there any testing methods that you suggest? In his company, uh, in Joy's company, uh, they test with colleagues, for, for instance, although it, might, it may not be the target group. Well, I think you can test most of the, the usability things that you want to test without um, actually needing someone who is an expert or a, a user um, from your product. You know, um, being able to log in somewhere or to change a setting, that's something you can test with everyone. Um, and I think that grabs about 60 or 70% of the things you want to test. Um, and maybe that can be enough in your case. Um, yeah, if you really need your, your subject matter expert, your, your pro user, then, then you still need to convince your stakeholders to allow that. But um, you can ask people you know, on the street or your colleagues or your you know, brother, sister, partner, parents, you know, family. Thank you, Nick. And I see thanks from Joy. So we definitely answered the question. Uh, we have a question from Adam. Are there any small actions you do outside of stakeholder meetings to help advocate for research and get other people talking about it in order to drive the bottom-up excitement? Yeah, um, I, I do. Um, I've created a book once, well, a booklet. <laughs> I don't uh, want to make it sound like it's a 100-page book. Um, and then I leave that that book in in the in the canteen, you know, in the in the coffee place, you know, multiple times. So just people can, you know, they can browse while they wait for their coffee. Okay, what is that? And then they can read about it. Um, also, if I give a presentation to stakeholders, and then I always send out a PDF of what I talked about afterwards. And then it starts to spread across the company because it's just a digital file or that booklet. So I try to um, 
yeah, to to create my own um, what's the word? Well, I just wanted to spread around when I'm not there. So books and follow-ups through email. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, and thank you from Adam, who is um, a um, who was asking the question. Uh, and Stuart is asking, by the way, can you share the booklet? Uh, no, sorry, I can't. Okay. I had uh, an NDA that I'm not allowed to uh, share anything from uh, from that place. But it's it's what I can say is that it was like a case study that you would make for your portfolio, really specifically for that um, that research project, and then you know to make people interested in in picking up the booklet. It would have a nicely designed cover, you know, with um, you know the highlighted results, you know, plus so much conversion rate or something like that, or a quote by a user just to grab attention. So um, that's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Great. And we have a question from Stuart. Uh, how do you organize your workshops? Um, if it's in real life. Because that's not always the case anymore. Um, I try to, you know, if it's at a company, I try to uh, book a room. A room that's big enough for people to walk around and to, you know, uh, put sticky notes on the wall and, and uh, stuff like that. Also with a big screen to, you know, share some slides. If it's, um, if it's a virtual a uh, virtual workshop, then I always try to find a collaborative tool. And I think you know uh, a good one, <laughs> of course, to use. Um, and then I, I want people to be as interactive as possible uh, within, you know, we, we have uh, quite a few tools to use. Um, and then I, I think of a structure, you know, a very generic intro, first of all, broad questions, and then really getting to the specifics later on once people start to understand more. And that's what happens, you know, during the uh, during the workshop. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Stuart, please let us know if Nick answered your question or you have anything to anything else to ask. Yeah. workshop structure is very difficult it's, it's very specific for the questions that you have and the first phases of your project so there's no one size fits all answer for it and the next question is how do you convince stakeholders to conduct more qualitative research where conversions rate increases are not that evident um well, I what I like to do in that case is, um, you know, it, it's going to be a bit more dirty in, in that regard, is um, um, I've done a project where accessibility was important, but the stakeholder didn't want to, to, to work on it. So I knew someone who was, I think, 90% blind, 80 or 90% blind, and... Um, I asked that person to use the app, you know, the product from the stakeholder. And I asked her if I was allowed to record her doing so. And, um, well, that was a bit of a shocking video. You know, she was unable to, um, oh, I see the question coming in. How did you recruit that person? Well, I, I knew that person. You know, it was a, a colleague. So you have to be a little bit lucky that you know someone like, uh, you know, that's useful for that situation. But the recording of that person, um, you know, struggling to even use the app, that was a, a, a real uh, smack in the face, you know, for, <laughs> figuratively speaking, for the, the stakeholder. And, um, and then, you know, some theory behind it, like 20% of people have accessibility needs uh you know something like that imagine that they're all unable to join or to use your project your product well that was um that was an eye opener for that person thanks again mm -hmm. and um 
we have another question. Well, we have tons of questions here, to be honest. So I'm like, you know, trying to to to, to see them all and ask all of them in order to, for everyone to, you know, to get the most of it. So we have a question from Jennifer. What is the typical... I'm sorry, uh, the question is uh, running away. What is the typical budget per user you are given for your research projects? Would you mind sharing? Um, well, I I don't have any numbers, uh, specific numbers. I can't say it's like a thousand or ten thousand or what, whatever, but um, it's mostly that I, you know, the product manager knows about it. And then if I say, well, I need this many hours, you know, then the stakeholder can uh, make the calculation if it's uh, reasonable or not. So, um, what I try to do is be as specific as possible about, you know, I need five people, one hour per person and two hours of, you know, uh, preparation. And then, you know, that helps in most cases. So I, I would think in, in hours and people instead of budget. Thank you so much, Nick, mm -hmm. for answering the question. Please, Jennifer. Oh. And Jennifer says, thank you. So you answered the question. Uh, there is a question from Liz. Have you found comparative study convince a stakeholder that don't budge when user research is not an option to launch? Mm. Um, well, if, if a stakeholder doesn't really believe in, uh, in, in the, the benefits of research, I, I don't think showing more you know research and data helps convince that person i think that person um, has his own uh, preference for things and then it's again about you know figuring out what what this person wants and then appease, appealing to to that desire and making sure that it that it helps um yeah I think if, if a stakeholder would be open for research, then we wouldn't be having this conversation because then people would be very reasonable and there wouldn't be a problem. Thanks. Uh, Liz, let us know if that's the answer. Yeah. Uh, and what, yes. Uh, Yes, it is. <laughs> and I would like to remind that we have like a couple of minutes left. We are trying hard to answer mm -hmm. everything you ask. Uh, but still, uh, I believe we have time for like one or two questions. And we have a question from Hella. Uh, seeing the conflict between stakeholders and UX researchers, I'm interested in knowing your opinion about researching UX management. Are there any practice-oriented topics that you think needs to be researched when it comes to UX management? Uh, well, I, I think more... Um, you know, UX is very new, so I think once we get more experience, um, we will be asked to join UX management or to become a manager of UX designers, and then it will that problem will become well less of a problem. Uh, I hope so, at least. And um, I, I, I think that's about it for for that question. I think we uh, we need more people in that position. And then we can bring our experience along. Hello, let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. Very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, well, actually, we have a question from Andy, I, I guess, in this regards. I wonder how you can prepare for this conflict and scope it out when we go for interviews for the role. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, repeat the final part of the question? Um, or maybe the whole question. <laughs> uh, probably the whole, the whole question will be easier, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andy is wondering how you can prepare for this conflict and scope it out when we go for interviews for the role. Right, right, right. Um, I, I think that's in the that, that notebook part and meeting one-on-one -on -one that, that I mentioned. I, I, you know, it's it's if you know that this very difficult meeting is coming up with a stakeholder at uh, 3 p.m. You know, then hopefully you already know who this person is um, based on previous experience or by talking to other people, 
And then you can work out some of the things that you want to say, you know, think about what this person might say back and how to tackle that. I think that's that's very helpful. So, so prepare for a meeting. Don't just wing it. Thank you so much. And, well, okay, that will be the last question for today. Uh, the question is, um, I am wondering how you would handle when you disagree with the business goal and similarly when another stakeholder disagrees with one of your designs or research. How would you manage this disagreement? Um, well, if you disagree with the business goal, I, I think that's a, that's a big problem um i if, if this person is still in the in in the meeting um then my question would be do you have an example i think that's maybe more valuable to to talk about something specific because i think if you disagree with where the business is going you might not be at the right business humans as just curious in general in the future oh. just curious in general okay um yeah th th that's very difficult to to um to solve um i i think going for the small win you know if you have your ultimate goal in mind and you know the five things that you need to do to get someone there you know this is, this is very theoretic um you know see if you can get do that first step you know, first, it sounds a bit bit strange, maybe, but um, you know that person needs to start to believe in 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 your view on things. And um, if you can show that person with actual results, then you can turn that person in time. So um, yeah, don't expect that to to happen in a week. You know that that can take the entire year. Um, but let's try and stay open and friendly for that person, involve that person, and um, see if you can spot a change in how this person reacts to you, you know, compared to three months ago, for example. Um, if so, it means that there's potential for more. But if you're if you keep running into the same problems every time, then you I recommend you to consider or well, to reconsider if you really want to convince this person yes or no because it might not be doable and then i think your you know how much you enjoy your work and your uh you know your mental health are then more important than to well at all cost convince the <laughs> the stakeholder i don't think it's worth it at that moment anymore Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for a great session. And well, that was the last question for today. Um, we still have plenty of them in the chat, but but unfortunately, we are a little bit out of time, over time. So feel, feel free to reach out to me if you still have the question you know, on LinkedIn or the designer's toolbox or email. Um, I'm sure I can help you at some point. If you want to see more events like this, make sure to check the upcoming ones at expression.eventbrite.com or check the recordings we've got on this channel. Take care, and I will see you around.